Good morning. It's good to see you again. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. I'm so glad that in a Baptist church I can do that with freedom. Uh, it hasn't been forever that I could do that. You know that, right? It's kind of like we divided the Trinity up. The Charismatics got the Spirit, the Episcopals got the Father, and we got Jesus. We got to get the boy back together. It's just one God. Amen? That part of the Trinity active in the world today is the Spirit of God. Nothing happens permanently without the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. In speaking about the Holy Spirit, I could talk about numerous subjects. I could talk about His person. If I was doing that, I'd go to John 16. I could talk about His gifts. I think I'd go to 1 Corinthians 12. I could talk about the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. I could talk about the baptism of the Spirit. But today I want to talk about the filling of the Spirit. Because the filling of the Spirit is the power that allows us to live for Christ every day. None of us have the spiritual power, the spiritual potential, the spiritual stamina to live every day, every moment for Christ without a continual presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Would you agree with me on that? Now, the Holy Spirit, I wish I knew more about the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, we're not given all that much in Scripture as far as precise details of how this thing works. So I want to kind of give you what I think, and then I want to go to a text and try to show it to you. Um, you've seen that famous picture of Jesus standing outside the door knocking, and there's no door handle for him to open. And, of course, the whole point of that is that the door must be open from the inside. I think you would agree with me that uh, as Baptists, we believe that we must personally respond to the gospel offer, which means we must open the door, metaphor of course, to let Jesus come into our life and salvation. Well, I submit to you theologically that we must also open the door to allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to fill us and continue to fill us throughout our days. It is an ongoing experience, but we have control of the spiritual door. I remember I was driving in West Texas years ago, and a, a song by Steve Green came on. You are as full as you want to be. Now, that was so different from everything I had heard up to that. Uh, growing up a Baptist, I believed you couldn't be filled unless you didn't spit, dance, or chew, or go with those who do. As if any of that's in the Bible anywhere. It's this performance-based Christianity that if I don't cuss this week, God will give me a little spirit. If I go to church three times, God will give me a little spirit. If I tithe, God will give me a little spirit. God is desiring to give you all of His spirit every day. And the only reason you don't have it, because you don't want it. We can be as dynamic and as gifted as we are prepared by God to be, but as salvation is a cooperation and a personal relationship, so is the power and ongoing presence of the Spirit of God. There's nothing magic here. There is volition here. We should turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I believe the Bible is the only clear self-revelation of God. I've talked to you about that. I do not believe that I'm inspired, nor my interpretations. I do believe that Scripture is inspired. So I desperately try to find out what the original inspired author was saying and then apply that truth to my day. The only way to find out what the original inspired author was saying is to be very conscious of context, literary context, historical setting, and those kind of items. So I want you to know that this probably is the definitive passage in all the New Testament on the filling of the Spirit. I also want you to know it's in the practical section of the book of Ephesians. All of Paul's letters being, we call them occasional documents, meaning they're written to a specific time, a specific need, a specific church. They all break into two halves, a doctrinal section that addresses that need and a practical section of how to apply that need. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not, is not, is not in the doctrinal section. This is not a doctrine we're to vote on or argue about. This is a life we are to live. 
Now, chapter 4, verse 1. Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. Chapter 4, verse 17. Walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. Chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you. 5.15. Do not live as unwise men or walk as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time. This is the practical section. This is not the doctrinal section. That is so important we see that. And then when we come to verse 18, I wish I had time to delineate more of this, but um, there's just a limited amount of time. (laughs) This is a command, an ongoing command from the Spirit of God through Paul to us. I think it should be translated, ever be filled with the Spirit. Which means that the Spirit-filled life is not the, the super spiritual This is not for missionaries and pastors and martyrs. This is the norm for every Christian every day. And that's what surprises us. Because we kind of got the Christianity divided into special folks and us. There are no special folks. There's just field folks. And field folks have power, relevance, and effect in a lost world. And every one of you here is a field folk. If you're not, you're not a Christian. Now, we do control the door to this. We do do control the continual level of that fielding. But field folks is what the world needs. It says ever be filled, which means it's an everyday experience, not a revival experience, special event, special moment, special mission. Every day. It's for all Christians. I personally, as a theologian, am distressed, and I can't tell you enough, about the dichotomy in the church between clergy and laity. I want you to know, if you'll check your New Testament, everywhere the word kleros is used, which is a word for casting lots used to the Levites, it refers to all the people of God. And everywhere the term we get laity from, which is the Greek word laos, which is the Greek word for people. There is no special part of us. Every Christian is gifted. Every Christian is called. Every Christian is filled if they want to be. Now, this new way of looking at the church. The church is not this beautiful building. The church is you. And wherever you are during the week, that's where God wants to fill you and use you. I don't care how high we jump in here. If we're not the people of God when we leave here, it's a disaster for the kingdom. Amen, Brother Bob. Thank you very much. How we love to get together here and be spiritual. I want to talk to your co-workers. I want to talk to your spouse and your children. We'll talk about spiritual. If we're not filled on Monday, don't be jumping so high on Sunday. If this don't work when we leave, it ain't from God. Ever be filled with the Spirit. Now, because I teach the New Testament, and I hope you know this too, and I... I'm trying to give you information for you to say, where'd that fool get that? Because I want you, more than anything, to read the Bible for yourself. Amen? I'm trying to make you hungry for the kind of knowledge that God's allowed me to have to make you hungry so you'll start reading the Bible for yourself. I hope you know that Colossians and Ephesians are parallel books. They're written on the same outline. Colossians was written first to a group of heretics that were were destroying the church in a valley about 200 miles north of Ephesus. Probably a week or so later, based almost exactly on the same outline, Paul wrote a cyclical letter to prepare all the churches for this heresy that we call Gnosticism that was about to devastate the Western church. So if I can find a parallel between ever be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians, in Colossians, maybe Paul will say it a different way. You can't look at the margin of your study Bible because it's not a word parallel. But if you'll look at Colossians 3.16, everything around it shows you it's a parallel. And what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Exciting worship service? Speaking in tongues? Well, I'm not against any of those. I'm really not. Thank God for that. But I want to tell you what it means to be filled with the Spirit is not an emotional experience. It's a lifestyle empowered by God to bring the kingdom into its fullness. Colossians 3.16 says, Let... The word of Christ richly dwell in you. You mean being filled with the Spirit and letting the word of Christ richly indwell us is the same thing? Exactly. Now, because there's such confusion here, what Paul does, and look at your Bible, Ephesians 5, 18, the next two verses, Paul is going to describe what it means. Now, this is not Bob. 
This is Paul. And I don't care what translation you got, there it is. Five present participles are going to tell us what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Now, the first three, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree with this and like it, the first three have to do with singing. Singing, psalming, making melody. I, I don't know, I must sing at the wrong pitch or something, because every time I sing, I lose my voice. So I just mouth the words and tap my foot. But if I, if I sung during the songs, I wouldn't speak in the next time. So I, I don't sing a lot, but I, it's amazing to me when I drive over here When I put Sandy Patty on, how much I help that woman in my car. (laughs) I enjoy singing along with that. For some reason, I could, I guess, sing off pitch or something and have a good time. It just prepares my life for worship. I just thank God for Christian music. I just thank God we have it in our homes and our cars. Wait, I hear you. I listen to rock and roll too, you big fool, so get over it. I'm just saying Christian music is good. I like other music. I like other things. I got the Bee Gees in my car, so don't get weird on me here. But I'm just saying there is something that happens in Christian music that prepares me to hear from God, see God in daily things, encourages me experience in the past. I just thank God for it. The fourth one, look at your text, is giving thanks for all things. Ooh, I'm not there yet. (laughs) I want to be, I'm just not there. So the fourth characteristic of a spirit-filled life, three have to do with singing, psalming, and making melody, and the fourth is always giving thanks. I've met people like this, you know, they say, oh, praise God, I have a flat. Oh, glory, fever, hallelujah. No, I'm not there, friends, I am not there, I'm telling you. But I do think that a world view of a spirit-filled Christian is this, nothing just happens to God's children. In everything that happened, there is spiritual potential for life-changing, kingdom-building, witness, love, ministry, care, outlook in everything in the world. And once I get that in my mind, it changes the way I I do life. Um, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for a lot of years. You go to to really great Christians' homes. You go to really sincere Christians' homes where there's been a tragedy. And time after time, people who ought to know better say to me, didn't I tithe enough? Didn't I pray enough? What Did I say damn? Did I not tithe exactly 10%? Why this me? Why now? Why? Friends, we live in a fallen world. This is not the world that God intended it to be. If you keep some kind of checklist on God loves you based on how things are going, you're about 10 seconds away from losing every joy you ever had. Circumstances do not determine the presence, power, and love of God. Amen? Bible promises. Worldview by faith. God is with me and for me. I want to give the name of a book that's been real encouraging to me in this area. Next to the Bible, probably, get your pens out. There's no test, but you need to write this down. You'll get over it. Come, 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 come. Nobody's met a move. What do, you, what do you got, a photographic memory? I think if a speaker said this is the second book in their life next to the Bible that made the most difference, somebody would write it down. I can't see you balcony folk, but I know you're not moving. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whithall Smith, 18th century Quaker lady. Now, this book has been so powerful in my life. She, she talks about how two people, two Christians can face the same problem. One, it can draw them closer to God, almost like the wings of faith. And the other, get bitter and never go back to church again. And you know people just like that. Same thing has happened. One has just turned them into the very presence of Christ. And the other has turned them into bitter gripey, unattractive, absent believers. And what's the difference? The way we face this concept of thanksgiving and nothing just happens to God's children. The fifth one is real important. And I think you ladies will hug me after this, but don't because the makeup on my black suit really... My, I got to go home. Don't do it. <laughs> the fifth one has to do with submission. And I want you to look at your text now. The next verse down. This has nothing to do with men and women. Nothing. This has to do with the fifth characteristic. The other four are present active participles. This is a present middle participle that accentuates the subject. And what this saying is that Christians 
who are filled with the Spirit are submissive to one another. Christians who are filled with the Spirit are submissive to one another. Because we realize the more we know the Bible, the more we know that all of us are gifted, the more we know that none of us can do ministry alone, suddenly other gifts, they don't, they're not tolerated. They become crucial for an effective full ministry. And we realize that we desperately need others as we try to live for God and um, turn people to Him. And once you see that, then we can be submissive to one another. We don't always have to be in charge. We don't always have to be right. We don't always have to have our suggestions taken. It's really powerful. Submit to one another out of respect for Christ. Now, watch your text. Look at your Bible. Paul's going to further define what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So in 521... Um, right on down through the end of this chapter, he's going to talk about husbands and wives. Friends, if filling doesn't work at home, it's not from God. Amen? Now, we put on a really good front when we get out in public. But the trick is, if this thing doesn't work in the most intimate relationship of life, it's not the power of God. Now, would you look at your text, 522? Do you have italics in your Bible? Little words that are slanted. (laughs) I was in church one time and I said... What does that mean? And somebody said, oh, those are the words the Holy Spirit really wants to emphasize. No. Those are the words that are not in the Greek text, but are supplied for English readers. Would you see, women, that the word be subject is in italics in verse 22, which means this text is not a command for women to be subject? We're dropping the verb from the previous verse that means it's a present middle participle. The only command in this whole section on husbands and wives is husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's the only command in verse 25. You hear that, guys? If we're going to be leaders of our home, the command's on us to set a stage of sacrificial living to which women are encouraged to yield themselves to. Now, kind of follow with me. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 or so deal with children, children and parents. Then about verse 5 through 9, deal with home slaves and masters. All of these are connected to what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because if being filled with the Spirit does not penetrate our daily life, it's not from God. Now, I think we talk a lot about the Spirit. I think we fight a lot about the Spirit. I think we gripe a lot about the Spirit. But I want to ask you this. Are you living in the Spirit? It so, it so tickles me. You get a concordance, you look up the word filled, and it says stuff like this. You can be filled with love, you can be filled with greed, you can be filled with lust, you can be filled with the Spirit. That filling kind of characterizes what our life's all about, and we have a choice in it. I, I always get tickled. In uh, Acts chapter 2, it says Peter was filled when he preached the Pentecostal sermon, first sermon of the church. Peter preaches the second sermon of the church in Acts chapter 3, and the Bible says Peter was filled. In Acts chapter 4, it says all the apostles were filled. Well, the theology is obvious. Peter leaks. (laughs) And so do you. We all got holes in the bucket. Amen? And if we do not have enough Jesus coming in on a regular daily basis, we get pretty dry pretty quick. We cannot live this life in our own resources. It, the Christian life is as much a supernatural gift and a supernatural empowerment as is salvation. We don't, salvation is not a product we get when we pray a prayer and that's all we need till we die. Salvation is the beginning of a relationship that's meant to get better and better as the days go by. And filling is that repeatable experience where we consciously and knowably allow the power of God to flow through us. I, I used to I go to school every morning early, and if I waited and got late, there's a, I live in about 20 miles from the school on a windy road. There was a lady that drove 25 miles an hour, and that was her high speed. If I got behind her, I had to pray to be filled several times because it leaked out rather quickly. And I tell you the truth, sometimes the way school goes, the way way students go, I need to be praying at 11 o'clock. Lord, I'm empty again. I need your presence and power. It is a world view. It is a conscious yielding to the presence, power, and equipping of God. It is a realization that God wants to empower me, but I must allow him to empower me. It's a world view as much as it is a theology. And it is a way of saying, Lord, I need you every day, every week. Way with everyone. And suddenly, when that happens, 
then life becomes ministry possibilities. And that's not a Sunday thing, that's a life thing. So I want to ask you a question. Would you bow your heads just for a minute? I want to ask you a question as we pray. Are you willing right now to ask the Lord to fill you? Are you willing to be His instrument in your world? Are you willing to be available to what He wants to do in your life? Ever be filled with the Spirit. Now look at me just for a minute. Just for a minute. The musicians are coming. Would you look at verse 18? I've always been amazed why don't get bombed is in the same verse as get filled. Isn't that funny? What does getting drunk have to do with being filled? If we met somebody drunk, could we tell? Could the motor skills and the, the breath and you could tell, right? This guy is whoo Well, do you get drunk once? And those characteristics last the rest of your life? No, you have to get drunk again and again for those characteristics. The same is true of the filling of God. We must choose to allow that experience that we had when we were saved to become the characteristic experience of our lives, to dominate our choices, to dominate our interpersonal relationships, to dominate how we choose to live. Ever be filled with the Spirit is the call of God. For you today. May we stand.